Welcome to the careers panel. This is a first for us at QHack. We uh, usually just do like talks and other stuff, but uh, we're gonna do something more a bit discussion oriented. So uh, uh, hopefully you all enjoy this. Um, we have some really awesome guests. I'll introduce them all to you. Um, so from my left all the way to the right, uh, we have Roger Luo here. Uh, Roger Luo is a PhD in physics at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I was uh, in the same group as Roger for a while, so I know him quite well. Um, he's worked for QERA, and can I, can I say he's worked for QERA? Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Roger will be with QERA uh, shortly after he finishes his PhD. So a uh, round of applause for Roger Luo, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, then we have Richard Given. Richard is the uh, CEO of Haiku. 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 Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say Haiku with a Q. That's what got me mixed up. Uh, Haiku, if you haven't heard of it, is a startup building software to enhance the performance of quantum processors. Go check them out at haiku.ai. That's the website. Uh, round of applause for Richard. Um, okay, and then we have uh, Jake Maliaros. Uh, he's a senior venture manager at Creative Destruction Lab. Uh, Creative Destruction Lab is right here in Toronto. Uh, it's a global startup program for seed stage science-based companies. So uh, I've interacted with Jake several times and the, the CDL bootcamp you have. Yep, that's, uh, that's a good time as well. So uh, welcome to Jake. Round of applause to Jake. Yep. Um, and then uh, lastly, we have our moderator, our host, uh, Anastasia Marjankova. Um, she, she's, I got a long list here, so I'm going to get through it here. Um, she's a researcher at Georgia Tech in the Quantum Optics and Telecommunications Lab, Vice Chair of the IEEE Quantum Computing Standards Project, and uh, she has a YouTube channel, which is uh, quite popular in, uh, in, this, in this community. Um, you know, demystifying quantum technologies for everybody in the community. So uh, please welcome uh, Anastasia. So um, we're gonna we're gonna just get right to it. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us on the live stream as well. We will be taking questions afterwards. So about ten five minutes ish. Uh, at the end, we'll have some questions. We'll pass around mics for the in-person audience first and get to questions in the audience. So. Um, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's kick this off. Anastasia, floor is yours. Perfect. Nice to see everyone here today. I hope you're enjoying QHack. So first of all, I want to ask from all the panelists here. So we did a little bit of introduction, but what really inspired you to start your career in quantum computing? And really, how did you get started in the field? Uh, sure. Great to see everyone and uh, everyone online. Uh, yeah, I used to study physics at the University of Waterloo. Um, I started to see this trend of people really exploring what this technology could do. Um, I had a professor I really got along with, and um, I, I kind of kept bugging him to, to get it closer to his lab to see if I could help out, and uh, uh, I was fascinated, right? To see that what the potential this technology could do uh, and how we were still at the very early steps of it was, um, was fascinating. So uh, that led me on my journey. Uh, that was about nine years ago, um, and ever since I've been hooked. Yeah, kind of similar to Jake. I had studied, I studied at Stanford engineering physics, and then later into the game, I got into quantum. And I thought it was stimulating, but then when I learned more about potential ecological consequences, which was important to me, it, it sort of motivated me to get into it further. I was a little academically burned out, so I didn't want to do a PhD, and I was angling to start a company. And serendipitously, I met Sam, who's somebody that Jake knows, uh, and joined Creative Destruction Lab, which is where I met Jake and some people in the audience and ended up starting a company that way. But uh, I also intentionally like, I got into CDL as a way to understand who was who in the industry and potentially get a job. So it, 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 it happened how it happened, but it was all a bit of networking. Uh, yeah, I probably, since probably roughly similar. I, uh, I started like learning about uh, simulating metabolic body system and like, uh, I actually started with using like um, doing some machine learning project for simulating quantum metabody, and then I uh, learned that quantum, uh, quantum computing could be a, like a very powerful tool for uh, to do these kind of simulations. So, so that's how I started working with quantum computing. I think that's a big question we all get asked. I, I know I, I get a lot, right? How did you know that quantum computing was going to become a big thing? And as you hear from these stories. We probably didn't, we were just fascinated by it. So my personal story is, I've been in the quantum space for almost 15 years now, Georgia Tech Quantum Optics, and the story is, 
kind of a bummer to a lot of people in that I emailed one professor in the biophysics lab to do research on like how snakes move and they said they wanted a third year and the second one responded, yes, we'll take you because you know how to solder and that's how I got into quantum physics. So that's about it. But I think ch things have actually changed a lot in the last, really about the last decade is really when industry started popping up in quantum. So can you share, what's really cool about this panel I think is we, kind of all came from, okay, this is an interesting field, but went into different directions in terms of venture, academia, or startups. So can you share a key moment that convinced you, A, quantum was the right way to go, and why you picked that specific direction? Yeah, so a little bit more context. As I, um, as I was fascinated on this journey of quantum, uh, I got exposure to a lot of uh, up and coming startups. Um, I got a lot of opportunities to work with them and, and support them. And um, there was an opportunity to build something called um, the Hyperloop Project, which was really a SpaceX challenge that uh, as students, we kind of co-founded a team to develop this higher form, higher speed form of transport. Um, and this was really where uh, the systems of different disciplines got merged together. Uh, more of my entrepreneurial spirit got engaged. Um, and after that experience, um, you know, we, we got just uh, an amazing way to, to demonstrate this technology. Uh, and it pulled me more into how can I integrate these interests into quantum. So actually, that led me to build out um, uh, the concept of my own startup, which led me to CDL. Uh, and as I was participating through the program, there was an opportunity to actually join the team and support its growth and uh, engage with the ecosystem in a different way. So it was really a unique way for me to help um, push the ecosystem up, as well as learn from what were the trends and the market opportunities, uh, and what were the things holding back quantum commercialization, um, which uh, I think we're getting closer and closer to, to alleviating some of those barriers. Yeah, I knew I liked it in school when I was willing to do the work, because generally I would be quite lazy if I didn't like it. So when I found that I was sort of excited to do it, I knew it was for me. And then I think at the time I was working on PNT, another startup uh, positioning and timing related to this. And when I found that maybe uh, inertial quantum sensors could perform, could outperform satellite-based systems considerably in some settings, that's when I started thinking about it practically. And then when I learned about potential ecological ramifications. I say potential because there's not applications that work, so we can't say definitively. But when that was a prospect, and when it seemed like there could be some you know, fundamental new technological cycle that you could catch the wave on, I think it was the convergence of those things that made me want to get into it. And then it was meeting the right people. And ultimately, if you meet smart people that you get along with outside of what you work on, then you should just keep working with them. Uh, for me, I'm probably not yet so, like uh, fully convinced uh, to like to to bet on quantum computing, but uh, I'm probably more like uh, uh, being op optimistic while being s skeptical. Uh, and uh, I, I I think when I started like uh, working with a real quantum computing project was really kind of trying to help my colleague the, to make a simulation faster, as, from like a computational physics perspective. But, but uh, uh, the, from the other point, uh, like uh, perspective is uh, like we all know like uh, part of the original reason that Finman proposed uh, uh, doing quantum computing was uh, we're able to do real-time uh, dynamics with qu uh, quantum computers. So, so that's still something uh, attracts me and uh, makes me feel like optimistic about uh, certain things. So what has been the most challenging aspect of working in the quantum computing field? I think, you know, as we know, this is a very new and niche field. Um, I think for the last decade or so, there's been a lot of that discovery of where the opportunities for commercialization might be or where the true applications are. A lot of that discovery has shown that a lot of it is later when we build larger scale quantum systems. Um, and now there's this push and always has been of how do we get there sooner? How do we make the economics work? Uh, and how do we actually build um, something scalable here? One of the issues that we see with CDL and one of the kind of opportunities is, as well with this is, uh, is around the quantum supply chain, right? So there is a number of companies now emerging, building enabling technologies or technologies such as error correction, control, uh, interconnects. And they're finding the right way to fit in the ecosystem. Do they sell to these large players? Do they kind of build their own system? Uh, and how do they do that without the resources or the massive demand that we see in other industries? So it really is an important um, challenge to solve. And I'm hoping that we can 
build a more rich supply chain and, and ways to support that um, as we uh, continue to grow this ecosystem. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are inherently difficult about doing a startup that are then hard to decouple from doing a quantum startup. But probably the most like frustrating on a daily basis is the state of hardware, because you have things that you simply can't test. Uh, and then to give you some like historical analogy, when Microsoft was trying to build the DOS, they were building it for this Intel 8008 chip. But they didn't have a chip, so they had to build a simulator of that chip. They had the memory specifications, et cetera. They had to build a simulator of that chip on a PDB-10 and then build the DOS based on that simulator. And then they had one opportunity, as the legend goes, to test it. Uh, and we're not really at the point where we even have an, like one existing Intel 8008 chip where we can go test something on. And of course, the other difficulty is that the simulator, in some cases, there might only be some 5% discrepancy. And of course, the context there is it's, you know, specific to the type of noise. So coherent noise is still very hard to model. But we've tried a lot of things that work very well on simulator, on noisy simulator, and only some of them will map. Uh, and then you can't do so, you can't, you might say, okay, well, I'm gonna go build a much more uh, realistic simulator so that I can test things in house, and that way I don't need hardware access. But by the time you build that realistic noisy simulator, the noise model of the existing chips have changed, and that effort is futile. So it, it is quite difficult to be doing near-term relevant things, given the rate at which the hardware is changing and the state of immaturity of the hardware. So yeah, hard, the hardware doesn't suck. I'm not going to say that. But it definitely makes it harder. Yeah, I feel, I feel one challenge thing for me is uh, like being able to work in like, a large collaboration, uh, actually in an industrial group. And uh, you, you, you're now just having like, uh, academia researchers, but there are also a lot, a lot of engineers uh, with very, very different background. And, and people are speaking entirely different languages. Uh, uh, it, so so it, uh, it feels to me like, uh, uh, it, uh, like this is something new to our community, and uh, it's probably not new for other, other industry, but like uh, industrialized, uh, this is really necessary to push the engineering forward. And, and that still remains a challenge, I think. That's really funny because in my pitch, I'm always like, back when I was in school, I had to sit in a lab with only physicists, and now we get to talk to people from all sorts of backgrounds, right? These are going to be the domain experts that are actually using quantum systems. Like, I'm likening it back to the 60s, 70s, right? The physicists were building the computing systems that everyone uses these days. But I get what you mean. You know, sometimes I'm, you know, working with a group of physicists, and they're like, why can't we ship this as as is? And it's like, 30 different packages and it's a 30 page install guide with like an old version of a thing that only works on like one specific version of Microsoft and I'm like no we, we can't like actually ship that to a customer like that's why we have product engineers and enterprise grade technology right so positive and negatives of uh, working in that space so I think one connecting thing for all of us has been obviously we haven't all just done this journey on our own into the quantum space. So can you tell me maybe about a mentor that you've had in your life that has helped to kind of bring you up to the next level in the quantum space and how that's played a role in your career development and the direction that you're going? Yeah, I mean, I'll talk about a, a mentor. And part of the reason actually we have um, created the quantum stream at CDL uh, a little bit of storytelling here too is, uh, you know, Xanadu had come through the program of CDL, the AI stream, many years ago, about seven, eight years ago. Uh, and this was one of the primary factors along with um, a, a scientist, a researcher, Peter Wittek, who's unfortunately no longer with us, but was a leading quantum machine learning expert. Um, the, 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 those joint forces was part of the reason we started this stream, uh, to try to get ahead of the curve and, and help the ecosystem. Um, so Peter was someone that I engaged with uh, in Waterloo, he came for a talk, I, I knew about his work, um, and he really, even though I was young and early in my career, gave me a chance to, you know, to hear me out and to compel me in certain directions of my ideas and uh, was, uh, was a big factor of what drove me closer to CDL um, to try to keep, uh, keep the legacy going. So, um, yeah, he, he was a great, great mentor, and I know even some people from the audience uh, I, I got connected to through that as well, so, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I didn't have a very like a quantum computing specific uh, mentor. I did have a professor, uh, Ad Adam Boland, who teaches at Stanford, who did a lot of the theory underpinning the initial supremacy, Google supremacy experiment. Think what you will about it. 
but he, he taught with a very infectious, positive energy, and I think that's what ultimately got me excited from day one. I would say from the company perspective, I had lived uh, with friends who were starting companies sort of at the seed stage at the time, and when you see people go through that, I mean, I was quite literally, you know, renting the same room, uh, sleeping in the bed in the other side of the room, like paying like 600 bucks a month to share that room, and this person would wake up and take a call in the morning, and I would just be sitting there eavesdropping. So once you see somebody going through the process, it demystifies us a lot. You know, how do I raise money? How do I do all these things? Once you realize that's tangible and, and plausible, and then you have some interest in doing quantum computing, it becomes a lot more realistic. So I, I would probably owe it to those two people. Yeah, for me, uh, I, yeah, I probably have more uh, two two mentors as well. Uh, so so uh, so first of all, I, I was uh, I, I was almost gonna be a, like a C++ engineer bef uh, five years ago. Uh, because I had a visa issue with my PhD, the other PhD program, and uh, uh, my current supervisor and my previous supervisor just uh, uh, managed to bring me here in Canada, and then uh, I can continue my research. Uh, and I think they also taught me like how to think like a physicist, uh, all, all these renormalization group uh, stuff. Um, so which kind of influenced a lot on my research styles and what I do afterwards. So now, what advice would you give to someone who wants to get into the quantum computing space today, whether it's industry, academia, venture, anything? Well, I, I think we're going through a bit of a transformation. Um, the engineering of quantum systems is becoming more and more important. Um, I, as mentioned, kind of in the past eras of new emerging computing technology, a lot of the kind of science and physics of it was being developed, and now we're starting to have certain systems um, tuned, scaled, make more efficient, and that requires a lot of in interdisciplinary knowledge. So I do encourage people, if you are interested in it, to kind of continue to align with the things that you have already been building, but also dive into some of these other subdisciplines to learn about how they might intersect and, uh, and ways to help them uh, to kind of lift it all forward. Um, I, I really am, you know, curious to see how we, um, you know, make these systems economically viable, uh, and that's going to require us to lower the cost of, you know, designing many qubits and d building control systems at a high speed and uh, and doing many more of, of these interdisciplinary things. So, um, yeah, you know, continue to learn and, and keep working on how these intersections uh, occur. Yeah, I'll, I'll take more of a software uh, perspective, but in general, the simplest advice. I'd give about getting a job. I, I think we've hired 16 people now, and it's like, for just for statistics, it's like 60% PhD, 40% postdoc, and the remainder has no quantum background, it's more software engineering. And by far the most useful trait or the most useful thing you can do in an application is exhibit with a demonstration some code base or some paper, something either that you've come up with or you've taken a paper, extended it a little bit, and tested it. A lot of people will apply with sort of cursory knowledge of Qiskit and they've built a QAOA or something. But, you know, there's, there's a lot you can do that is not implemented already and is low-hanging fruit and just shows that you have the familiarity to use the tools, which ultimately on the jobs means you can operate more quickly. Because as, as part of any job, like, even if you're a researcher, th there might be some lucky few, especially in a, in a small startup, who are entirely theoretical and they can stay in their heads. But for most people, you have a dual capacity some operational capacity where you have an idea and you need to prototype. Otherwise, you generate ideas at a too great a rate and then you can never test them and you have this backlog. So you need the ability to test ideas uh, and, and you need to be able to test them relatively quickly. So if you need to learn all the tools on the job, it just means, and this is more from a startup perspective, but it generally applies that that company is paying a time cost for you to do that and really they should be paying for your thinking time. Uh, and so I would just say, be familiar with the tools. It's actually very important, even if it feels, you know, supplementary or, or sort of operational, you don't feel like doing it. But demonstrating that you can program with decent style, that you can es essentially communicate with a programmer whose job it is to systemize your prototype is really important. So if I was gonna give a useful piece of advice, it would be that. Uh, but I would also say, like, I agree with Jake that hardware is very cool. Uh, and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, but you need to, you're very specific. It, it, there's a lot of modality risk where it's very specific to the modality that you work in. With software, it's, it's, it's definite that we need to take a lot of the ideas that exist classically 
and implement some analog for them in a quantum sense, though it won't be a direct analog, it's going to need to be specific to how the industry works, you can begin thinking about that now. And you could very likely put out some open source thing that has a long longevity to it because it's useful. Uh, so I would be, I, I, I would encourage you to look for some low hanging fruit and some white space within software because I think there's a ton. Uh, that's, what, that's what I would say. Just really quickly, I will say for the physicists out there, first thing I do to any physicist that joins my team is I give them a copy of clean code because as I say, physicists are really good coders. They're terrible software engineers. So just by having that background already, it makes a lot of that interdisciplinary work with software engineers a lot easier. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. Like, it, uh, I kind of started my software journey by working with some random open source person, people uh, through PyTorch and other GitHub large packages. And basically, after you read uh, other people's code, and uh, it's, it's like uh, reading a nice textbook, you, you kind of start learning the actual engineering ideas. And it's going to be very hard to learn from the uh, like the actual uh, university course or textbook. And and uh, uh, when doing interviews, uh, you can actually tell like uh, who actually actually uh, think about how to write a program with good abstraction, and who who never thought about it, just want to finish work. And there's like a huge distinction when you actually read the uh, Candy's code. So 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 I would suggest to you to actually read a piece of good, uh, good code and try to even contribute to open source software and that will uh, help you learn a lot of things. Definitely, one of my mentors when I started getting into the classical software game, as I call it, says physicists think procedurally when they're writing code and so they just go A, B, C, right? You just write it all in one file. Computer scientists think more functionally. It's a little bit of a different way that they're taught to think. So once there was actually words put to that and I could look it up. That structure made a lot more sense to me of how we can engineer a system that can be you know, deployed to a million users, something like that. So as we mentioned, there's a lot of low hanging fruit, which to us it seems obvious because we're in the space every single day. But for some people, they walk in and they go, there's so many physicists working on all aspects of software hardware. So what are those untapped potentials, applications, areas in the quantum computing space that someone today might be able to do on their own and show that? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I think there's a lot. I think there's, I, I, I'm just not going to divulge on hardware because it's, it's not my focus. I think there probably is, but the risk, I, I think it's unlikely that you're going to start your own hardware company unless you can raise an incredible amount of capital. So the likelihood is you need to find the low hanging fruit within another company. So if we're speaking in a broader sense where you don't need to get a job in a specific place, software is the better perspective. Um, there's, there's basic problems. There's a lot of problems in compilation. And if you look at classical compilers, all of them were de developed in collaboration among competitors, which would never happen unless it was that complex to develop. Uh, and I, I don't think it's going to be any less complex for a, a, qu a quantum compiler. So you can expect there's a lot of problems. There's, there's some problems where you can't compile quickly enough uh, let's say you have a series of 200, 2,000 circuits and you need to compile them all quickly before there's some decalibration that happens. Um, this, this is still a problem in a lot of settings. In our case, what we find a lot is during the process of building our platform and doing research, we develop internal tooling that we then would try and open source. And we're, we're going to release uh, an open source sort of QML transpiler, uh, I guess, when we, on the 15th or something. But the point is, we find through the process of building something that there's a lot of tooling missing. So it's a bit of a cop out, but I would say try and build something and it will become very apparent to you. In the case of this transpiler, it's that, you know, let's say you're doing something variational and you're just updating parameters, angles by some small amount. For most transpilers, you need to retranspile the entire circuit every single time, even when all you're doing is changing some gates. Uh, and so it's a simple fix, but it doesn't exist. And so there's simple things like this that just relate to speed, which ultimately relate to time and then cost of using the device that are very important. So yeah, my advice would be go try and build something meaningful, and you will find a lot of tooling that is missing. Uh, and tooling is perhaps it excites you less, uh, which, is, which is fair enough. But I would look at you know, sort of the more complex tooling you, you are thinking about building, it corresponds to the more complex idea you're also considering building. You, you need more complex tooling for more complex things. So if you find yourself in the position 
uh, needing some complex tooling, it means you're probably on the hunt for some, some interesting idea anyway. It's funny, from the hardware side, I actually, uh, I get a lot of nonsense from people online being like, why do you use Windows? Some tools are o only work for quantum like control systems on Windows 95, not even like the latest versions of Windows. So literally, if you can rewrite something like that so it would actually work, that would save my life. And there's a lot of these tools like that out there. So you know, talk to your local uh, folks in the startup and, and ask uh, what they're working on, because yeah, this is a big problem. Yeah, I think a, another uh, side of the spectrum, and I think whatever application you're working on or you are interested in mixing in that domain, it really comes down to benchmarking, right? This is a big part of what's going to be relevant to a potential user, a potential customer, uh, or even to see is your algorithm actually outperforming something out there. So right now, there is a lot of nuance with the idea of first resource estimating, and then benchmarking, and then scaling it on different types of hardware. Uh, and I know there's tools emerging in that space, but um, finding a streamlined like flow or process um, to, to kind of do this with, with what you're building, uh, it's critical to, to kind of actually make that impact and even measure how much of an impact it's going to make. Um, and in, in many cases, this is what uh, a lot of our startups we, we found is one of the key ingredients for them to, you know, once they engage with their first customer, their first pilot, how do they actually take those results um, and scale the, the credibility for them to, to kind of go into other people and say, look, we worked with this you know, organization, we looked at these chemicals in this way, we're now able to show that this method is superior or, or can be more helpful. Um, and right now, I think it's still a big barrier for, uh, for many demonstrations of quantum and, and what's going to open up our way to eventually quantum advantage. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of I kind of feel that Windows problem too, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, oh, what makes me thinking is uh, like I, I feel uh, our like in, especially in terms of software community, uh, we kind of start with more high level stuff uh, like from like quantum info th uh, machine theory and start building software for those like quantum circuits and uh, trying to push that and uh, maybe a little bit lower to uh, version of algorithms. But uh, the inter uh, at the low level interface and low level software for the actual hardware is, uh, is not that well explored yet. And uh, uh, one reason is because uh, uh, the hardware wasn't uh, that easy to access and wasn't that powerful yet. But uh, I think uh, with the progress of hardware and uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to write those uh, low level uh, softwares and it's going to be very useful for a very near term. Yeah, and I think there's definitely a little bit about, I don't know if you all have seen this, but I, I like to just poke through job applications all the time and see what's happening there. I've noticed in the last few years, some quantum companies, everything was Python based for the longest time. It's been Python based for a long time. I've been seeing more and more Go and Rust kind of popping up in job descriptions. Not sure if you've seen that, but that's always interesting, right? It's like you don't have to always start with something completely novel if you want to contribute to the field. Even writing a package in a language that doesn't have it will help you learn a lot about what's going on in the internal systems. Yeah, I agree. I think that would look very good. So I, I think you've written a lot on Julia, for example. So if, if you did this, it would stand out yeah, to, to anybody looking at your job application. I wanted to add one more, because I didn't give anything conceptual. It was more tooling perspective. I do think, I think there's a, I wouldn't say low hanging fruit. I think it's hard, but I, ultimately people will do it. And I think it's interesting uh, within QML. But I think there's two perspectives. There's some people that approach QML as basically to, to serve the same functions as ML in, in maybe a faster or more efficient way, like classifying images. I think that's the wrong approach. I think it should be sort of a more condensed matter or physically inspired approach where we should try and do things like incorporate symmetries or invariances within the architecture, within the ansets um, of what we're working with. And I think there's an increasing interest in this. Xanadu actually does a lot or they've done some spin-based architectures, for example. So I, I think that's pretty fascinating. And inevitably, I do think people will find uh, cool architectures within there, and they, and they might make a difference in terms of rapid trainability. I love this brainstorming, actually, of just like going ideas. So I'm going to pop off another one. Um, so sometimes hardware companies, obviously, when they write papers, they don't always compare their own systems to other hardware. So maybe you go and do some benchmarking. My friend actually got banned from a certain company's system uh, for doing randomized benchmarking tests. 
and uh, published a paper on it that was like, yeah, you guys are not very accurate in this paper and compared to the others. So that's a really good one. I think that would also stand out on an application if you managed to get yourself banned from a platform. Yeah, that, that would, and, and it, it's definitely true. It's definitely true because they, they, don't, they don't tell you what processes they had to run to achieve a lot of these quantum volumes. And as you might have seen, quantum volume is not currently in vogue anymore because it was a hard benchmark to double. So that, it's that's, algorithmic that's why. Yeah, no, it's now. algorithmic qubits now. But there's also new ones, right? I think that's that's the thing. It's benchmarking is hard. If you can even, you know, really, I think in the end, what I'm looking for is also like, can you think? Can you contribute something new and interesting? And you know, there's there's a trend of folks going into application specific systems, and that's what I worked on, right? We will always lose in these parameters because we're not fully connected. Mm -hmm. That's just you know so. But does that mean that's a worse machine for certain types of algorithms? No. We're also seeing, you know, I was like Q2B a couple months ago, we're seeing like perhaps maybe trapped ion systems are gonna do a little bit better on, for example, machine learning applications. I've heard some people saying that. So even doing these sort of experiments and kind of talking about it and being like, okay, these are interesting parameters here, I think is super useful to the quantum community. And that's, you know, for someone that's less interested maybe in the programming side or developing something new, but they want to do more experimental research. I think that's a great approach. Maybe one more. Uh, I, I think resource intensity is a massive question right now. Uh, and, and I agree where some hardware architectures are going to be differentiated. I think largely on the basis of sampling rate. So how quickly can you run a circuit measurement, get something, run it again? If you're doing any sort of training process, the faster that sampling rate is, the, the faster you could train time-wise. Um, and it's, there's some papers like from Los Alamos that show rapid trainability or, or sort of a rapid ability, a few shot learning process to match states. But in practice, it's very hard to achieve those things. Uh, and in, I've, I've heard actually different things on, or experienced some different things on trapped ions because sometimes they're kind of slow, but they are a lot. They, they do generally have much higher fidelity. Um, the question for me is, and the same thing with neutral, um, neutral atoms, even though there's considerably higher fidelity are the sampling rates, which can be you know, order of a second too slow then to run any meaningful variational process. Yeah, it, this whole uh, discussion has got me thinking a bit too. And I think um, another one that came to mind here is if, if, if you're looking at one of the gaps right now uh, compared to things like machine learning, which I think machine learning is a really good example of you know, the open source community and a lot of communities like developing standardization. Um, we have a lot of data sets there where you can essentially benchmark on and train on. And one of the things uh, actually really like that Xanity's doing is they've released some, hey, here's some quantum data sets on molecules and things like this. And I think this is a start of something that we need to do more of as a community is like, how do you actually, you know, run this experiment with a certain data set you've generated, Monte Carlo simulations or on real quantum data. And then you basically keep that out there as here's our you know, MNIST or, or quantum MNIST type data set for that thing. And, and please benchmark on it with your algorithms and see if you can do better. Um, and we can start to converge a bit on, on comparing and contrasting, like what's working, what isn't. Um, and it's just a, definitely something that um, the field needs to go towards if we, if we want to kind of continue to like grow and uh, standardize. Yeah. Any other ideas? OK, maybe we can do some more brainstorming afterwards today or tomorrow. But uh, let's look a little bit into what skill sets we're looking for. We, we touched a little bit about this with the projects, but because it's so interdisciplinary, I'd like to hear from folks. What are you going to recommend people focus on if they want to enter the field? And you can take it from your own personal experience, like if you wanted to join your company or your lab or broader. Um, yeah, I would, I would probably more looking uh, for like uh, knowledge of compilers, uh, and uh, especially uh, um, for example, the uh, compilers that are connected to coding theories, um, like how to do uh, error correction, but uh, with concrete implementation that uh, actually compiles a circuit to uh, a bunch of uh, uh, physical uh, qubits and. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, like concrete uh, programming skills, uh, like ability to build complicated uh, software, like actually also is very important and also kind of missing uh, in our physics education. So, so that is something kind of urgently needed in a lot of company. I would, I would assume. 
Yeah, I think uh, I'm just to illuminate my answer, I'm just going to give some, some context. So the way we work internally, uh, structurally, is that we might have uh, a theorist working on an idea, and then there will be this type of person, a research engineer, who can think of their own ideas, but can also prototype uh, others' ideas. And then there will be a product engineer, a software engineer, that will systematize that in some modular fashion within the code base, such that it's accessible and easy to use, uh, easy to extend. Uh, we also do things like, if you're a theorist, you'll also have an observer status within the company. So it's important that each person owns the track that they work on. You, you need some degree of ownership to, I think, move with the right momentum. But it's important that you have these generally intelligent cross-disciplinary people across teams observing, such that all assumptions are correctly made. Uh, we've made mistakes where we've spent time trying to build something, and then there was an assumption in the appendix that we had missed, which like ultimately would have told us prior uh, not, not to take that course. Uh, and so given that structure, I would say that generally the most impactful, most like, in-demand role would be the research engineer. Because, and I'm echoing what I said earlier, but this person is capable of reading papers quickly, identifying, okay, what is the essential trick here? What is the essential knowledge we should check? Is it worth checking? Having a, a practical sense, it sounds obvious, but some people sort of lack the practical sense where they say, okay, well, this is a really stimulating and fulfilling technique, but it only generated some 10% performance improvement, so is it really worth prototyping? And probably not in that case. So you need the ability to discern when it's useful to actually try something, and the ability to scour for it, and then the ability to prototype. You don't need incredible programming style. You don't need to prototype that as if it's going to fit right into the code base. But you do need to give the software engineer something to work with that isn't the paper. So I would say if you have, if you have that, that dual set of skills, this ability to do your own research, to go through research, and to prototype it, even in a sloppy way. From, from my experience, that is the most in-demand set of skills. Uh, I think you guys put some awesome points there, especially on the technical. I'm going to diverge a bit out just to share a slightly different perspective. Um, so I've got some of my team here, Bree Healing and, uh, and Freya, and uh, they, you know, and, and Sam, who previously was with CDL and, and um, has the privilege of working with uh, Haiku now on their business side. Uh, really interesting set of skills here because all of them came without a quantum background into this team uh, and into kind of quantum roles now where you know they've developed thought leadership in the way that these um, you know quantum technologies are evolving right so how how did that you know mix and, and what do I recommend for that side because I think this is also a very key important side that we don't always talk about but is this you know how do you actually uh, build the operational the the management the business and the HR all these other things that kind of help the organizations run um, because, uh, yeah, it's this willingness, I think, to have patience and learn these very detailed and deep concepts. Of course, we're still trying to figure out how quantum actually you know, fits as a product and as a technology. Um, and having them kind of dive deep there, relating that to other concepts of new emerging technologies like AI um, or you know, the first new materials of, of a certain field, um, you know, it, it helps to kind of see those links and actually build a business system process to actually um, uh, spin these out. So um, yeah, I, I do encourage you to look at some of those roles too if you are interested in that side because it's also high in demand of, of how we're actually going to bring this out into the world. I, I actually want to just fully agree with that. It, I mean, I can tell you from my perspective, it's still entirely a people business in the sense that let's say you have an amazing technology. At the end of the day, you still need to meet and know and convince the right people to pay you to use that technology and you know, it, it might sound, but you, but you need to get paid because then you need to fund the funding to keep developing. Uh, and the people skills, the ability to efficiently communicate what is ultimately complex is in every industry an essential set of skills. And even if you're not on a sales side or on a growth side or on a business side, within an organization, you're always negotiating for the prioritization of your idea uh, because there's always a ton of ideas. So you need to advocate. So I would say yes, like be able to communicate efficiently. So uh, just to add on that, like uh, I, I kind of feel uh, there's there's one principle that I brought from a software engineering community called agile development uh, that I feel very useful is like uh, it really helpful help you move very fast, uh, uh, in, especially in a startup and uh, like. Uh, 
and and this uh, this is something that help you like iterate towards uh, something more uh, close to customer and uh, close to a viable product instead of just research. So so uh, being able to use the agile uh, principle in practice will be a big plus for a lot of things. I'm a Kanban person. I hate Agile, but that's a personal opinion. Um, everyone has opinions on this, right? But yeah, in the end, I, I do want to dive a little bit more into those soft skills, because I think that is really important, especially in interdisciplinary place like this. But I want to talk a bit about the hardware side as well. So I came from the hardware side, and I think a lot of people are coming from the software side, right? Because it's cheaper to do. You don't have million, two million to invest in your own quantum computer. but. My best mechanical engineer was a philosophy major from a state college, or a community college even, not even a state school in California. And really, the thing is, what we're looking for on the hardware side is people that can work with our hands. And you'd be surprised how many people coming out of elite colleges don't do that. 15 years ago, the first thing I did when I walked into the lab, well, before that, the only reason I got the job is because I could solder. And I did that because of robotics, not because of anything quantum related. I just walked in and I was like, I can make electronics. They're like, great. They sat me down and I made laser locking boxes for like two months. And it was amazing, right? And I got the hands-on experience. And, um, and that's what, so it's, you can still get hardware experience kind of moving into the field and applying it, right? You, you just need to start getting the feel of working with your hands with the hardware, whether that is you know taking maybe a machine shop class, something like that. Um, getting into the material space, like even the CAD drawings aspect of it, that's been super helpful. Um, what we've also been doing that's kind of really fun is 3D printing cryogenics parts and being able to play with those. So that's a lot cheaper method, right, to kind of get hands on with this. So I know some universities are starting to look into it as well, build kind of an open space, a maker space where you can kind of go in and play with the hardware. And I would really encourage people, if they don't have access to undergraduate research or lab research, Look into those maker spaces. Um, libraries in the US even have 3D printers available nowadays, which is super cool. You can get that for free. But as we talked about, it's about like showing that interest in quantum and, and doing these projects and showing that you know, you're committed to the growth of this field. So, And on the communication side, I want to dive deeper into that as well. Um, this is something that I see a lot. So I do a lot of interviews with junior folks. And I think communication is very overlooked. and when you're interviewing, you're not expected to know everything, right? And the thing is, I think academia teaches you. That's one of the most toxic aspects, I think, of the PhD was like, well, you're an expert in this tiny field. That doesn't mean you're an expert in everything. So learn how to you know, communicate and take that feedback. So I often do a code review, right? And I'm not going in there to make you feel bad. I'm trying to be very gentle. I'm asking why you did certain things. And what I want to see is like your thought process. And also, are you able to take feedback from me without getting defensive, right? And saying, my way is the right way. Right? And saying, like, oh, that's really interesting. I didn't think of it this way. And OK, maybe there's a way I could adapt this, right? Like, take it to the next step. And that's really showing me that the junior engineer is going to be kind of trainable in the correct direction to be able to work with different types of folks and really ask for help, um, I think, is another huge aspect in the quantum space. You're not an expert in anything. Even if you're an expert in hardware, software, you're not an expert in error correction, let's say. You need to be able to ask for help in this industry. Yeah, I think you nailed a really key point there, Anastasia, which is uh, something we look for not only in like our team that we recruit, but also a lot in the ventures and the mentors in our program to state this a lot, is coachability, right? So the ability for them to take feedback, I can't stress it enough. It is one of the most important skills in any in any of these areas. Um, and, and it kind of goes along with agile development because this idea of even taking feedback from customers or from the user of like what is actually the most important things to change here? What do we keep? And how do we actually continue to scale that? So um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I just think building out the process um, with with your mentors or with your uh, team that you're currently on, I think is a really healthy thing. Sometimes it feels very uncomfortable, you know, asking, being vulnerable to that, um, that, that potentially being torn down. But by building a kind of comfortable culture around that, it makes it much easier to, to make change and to actually grow at a faster rate. So really, really encourage that point. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, I agree and I would just add that it's also important to state your opinion, not in a combative sense. I'm not uh, basically countering the need to be coachable, but I'm saying if you're on a group call and a group discussion among a company, 
it's valuable if you speak up and say what you believe. Perhaps your opinion isn't even worthwhile, but the point is it sets some momentum for the conversation and encourages other people to speak. And in general, the culture of people feeling free uh, to speak their mind is much more effective than you know, some more dictatorial culture where you don't want to say something because it might be perceived as wrong and you might be perceived as stupid. Uh, and if you do find yourself in a setting like that, which I'm sure is common in some places, then I, 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 would, I would try and get out of it because I think ideally you want to be somewhere where you can just sort of unload what is freely accessible in your mind uh, without any additional adjustments. So I, yeah, I, I would just say like develop the confidence to speak up. And I say develop because I think it's a learned skill. Uh, learned in a very simple way, you just do it enough. And then you realize the consequences aren't so bad. So the reward function is there and then you keep doing it. But it, it is, yeah, just speak up. Yeah, so. Yeah, so so just uh, like Anna, like uh, I, I think being able to learn things like quickly is also is quite important. Uh, actually, I uh, when I started working with uh, compiler with a few other people in Quora, like no, uh, probably only two people actually have the experience, but uh, uh, we, we kept we keep seeing like you can do this. Yeah, uh, you, you did harder job before, and and, and uh, they they actually learn it in uh, like very short time. So so I'm pretty. I, I feel this is a very very nice uh, uh, ability, like a skill that, uh, and a very important in current industry because uh, the the whole thing is quickly evolving, and you have to learn new things every day. Yeah, I, I would say everybody in this field has been humbled because of how quickly it changes and how multifaceted it is. So I think if you find that you don't know something and you need to ask, you will rarely be met with distaste. Speaking of that, so back again in my day, uh, I keep saying that, there, there are research groups doing quantum computing, but you could kind of keep track of everything that was going on. And now you log into archive and how many papers a day are released in the field, right? So. How do you stay motivated and really keeping up with the trends and what's going on in the field when it's so complex and evolving so quickly? I'm very, very lucky uh, in the perspective I get to see with CDL. Uh, part of our role is we engage with a lot of early stage companies, uh, a lot of people thinking of spinning out of technology. Uh, they're researchers and they've worked on this for the last decade. They're like, how do we get this into a company? Um, and, and through that and through even our interactions with these companies, we get to see a lot of like what state-of-the-art technologies are on that cusp of commercialization um, and, and where they're able to articulate the value propositions of how those are differentiated. Um, it's not always obvious and part of where we try to help them, but it's also what has kind of pulled me in certain directions of, wow, these are really fascinating ways that the technology is evolving. This could maybe help error correction 10 to 100 times if they scale this up. So how do we actually position that as a, as a company or, or what, what do they really need to do? Because something is here. Um, so uh, one, one recent one, I mean, we are also very gifted with uh, Roger Malko, which I know uh, Roger's worked with here, but he's a, uh, one of our chief scientists at the, um, at the CDL. And um, they're, they're doing some fascinating work right now around uh, the intersection of transformer models with, uh, with quantum technology. And you know, if they're really good at you know, mapping language uh, and, and doing things like this, what if the language is qubits? Um, and they're very good at these long range contexts of how qubits interact. So can we use them for control, for better error correction methods, things like this. So I think we're, we're on the cusp of something very interesting there. And uh, that's another particular area that I, I recently really wanted to dive deeper into. Yeah, I, I, for us, we need to be very intentional about this because it's like a legitimately high risk. If you're pursuing the wrong course and you have finite resources to pursue some course, you can find yourself in, in deep water with little money left. So we have, we, we do a few things. The main thing is we do a journal club twice a week. So somebody, well, okay, we, we sort of choose somebody at random to make sure everybody's read it to give a summary of the paper and then somebody delivers that paper in detail and we go through it and everybody in the company shows up remotely and we go through it together and we do that twice a week, every single week. And we're gonna start opening those up actually to the public, uh, which will be cool. So once we have a website up, people can join and the aim is to not just go over the most recent paper, but also the most seminal papers. And we will occasionally get external people to come talk as well, and from an interdisciplinary background. So it might be something like, I don't know, diffusion models for like denoising Gaussian le levels of Gaussian noise. Um, so it, it's important that you have some exploration mechanism 
to scan the papers in depth because a lot of the times like the juice in the paper is not the topic of the paper. It is some experimental, experimental technique that somebody did to achieve the results of that paper because they happen to know it from, you know, I don't know, like a, backward, a background in tensor networks or something. So it's important to scan them in depth and the appendixes because sometimes you find those nuggets. So we have that exploration mechanism. And then we have like a system of uh, prioritization. I spoke about this a little bit, but essentially whenever we're going to start a new research track, we make sure we're listing all the assumptions of that track, sort of the hypotheses about what that track might lead to, um, our guess as to what impro uh, performance improvement we might see. And then once that is all logged, we see whether it's, it's worthwhile to continue. So I think you need both this, OK, this is from a company perspective, but you need some mechanism to explore. Uh, and also, like the Journal Club is very useful at getting everybody in the company to deliver a paper and to feel the ownership of that, to feel both the, the eyes of the rest of the company on them, but also the confidence that comes from delivering it and answering questions. Uh, in, our, in our interviews as well, when we bring on candidates, if they're a researcher, they give a journal club. So that Friday, they'll come and they'll do either their, their work or work they worked on. Uh, and then we will ask them questions. And you can really get the sentiment about how excited the team is based on how many questions they ask. And everybody's read the paper beforehand. If somebody is uh, more of an engineer, then we make them build a task, you know, which is, okay, it's a bit maniacal, but you just want to make sure people have good programming style. But yeah, to summarize, you need this exploration mechanism, but you also need to be able to prioritize. If you're a company, it's very simple because you have some objective to build something and it has some performance. But if you're just a student of quantum, then you just need to refine what are my interests. And I would say don't worry about it too much because the hardware isn't there. So you know, take your time. You have your time to explore. Oh yeah. So my, I, I just make more trying to make more friends, uh, friends everywhere, and you just listen to them. And sometimes they have unpublished or uh, like uh, early results, and uh, you just you uh, they get you just they just get you noticed like uh, hey this this is something I didn't know and I never noticed that, and it kind of helped me keep up with the like the new things. Yeah, for us, we called it Learning Cafe instead of Journal Club, journal club because, uh, yeah, we'd feed people for lunch on that Friday. So a lot more people showed up for that and actually read the paper to get the free food, you know? It's yeah, what you want to do. We're remote and cheap, so we don't, we don't do that. Yeah, Learning Cafe, that's what you got to do. So I, uh, actually, I want to echo also the um, make friends in the field. What I thought was really interesting, as I mentioned that machine learning on trapped ions, you guys started nodding. And that was probably, I don't even know, I, I definitely didn't read the paper on that. It was hallway conversations at conferences where we're talking about, it, hey, how's your research going? What are you doing? Oh, here, here's a result that we're seeing that's really interesting, right? So the more people that you talk to in the field find out what they're doing, you're going to get a lot of that kind of insider information that's already kind of taken out of the wall of papers that you have to get through. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, just remember how long it takes to actually write a good paper. So during the span of that time, there's a bunch of intermediary results. Probably every conference I've been to, especially the later ones, somebody has told me uh, and you know, like that they expect some result to come out on some qubit scale, which is either very exciting or very unnerving. And it happens almost every single time. So Definitely. yeah, go to conferences too. Yeah, go to conferences, and a lot of them have like free exhibit passes or student passes that are cheap, and you know there's sponsorships out there. So really encourage you to do that. Look at the local ones. There's actually a ton of conferences popping up all over the place, and the ones that you think may not be super quantum related could be. So last week I was actually at Photonics West, and you know Photonics is kind of quantum, but now this year there was an actual quantum section this year. Exhibit pass, free, you walk in, you talk to a bunch of people, it's a great time. Perfect, so let's wrap up uh, this kind of panel discussion and we'll open it for questions. So if you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice when you were just starting out, what would it be? I'll start with mine maybe then, <laughs> while you guys think on that one, because I've thought about this for a long time. but. My thing is, is more general, not quantum. If you're making a decision, you know, tr 
to try something new, usually you want to try it. Even if you think you, you might not be good at it, not, might not be interested, if it's a reversible decision, just go and try it. So for me, that changed my life. I was an undergrad, and I, I thought I was going to become a professor and stay in academia. And then I crashed the service at my university one night and got in trouble with the honor board. It was a very social network, Mark Zuckerberg type story. But instead of getting expelled, I actually got a check for seed funding for my first company. And I'd already been accepted for my PhD, but I thought, I'll do this for a year. What's the worst that can happen? I have no idea. I thought, you know, you had to be in your 60s to start a company. But I can just do this for a year and go back, right? And uh, it completely changed my life because then I sold the company, which was great. Went back to school, realized that wasn't the path, and that just opened doors to so many other things that I'm doing. So I'm really grateful for just no matter what the experience is, if someone says, hey, you want to try something new? I'm like, yeah, let's try it. What's the worst that can happen? People have a really short memory, so if you fail at it, no one's going to remember anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. I would say... I would say what, what I've realized is most generic advice that you might get from a business book or just some generic advice that somebody's giving you is, is usually true, but it has no meaning for you unless there's some experience you've had underlying it. So there's sort of a, a, a qualia, if you're familiar with the term, to that advice or that truth which you need to possess to appreciate the advice. And so I, you know, I'd read some of these startup books a long time before trying to start a startup, and I don't think I retained a single thing genuinely and they're very short books and they feel very shallow when you read them after going through the experience they make a lot more sense and i would say that's probably true for a lot of the advice that people give you like be patient it takes time be consistent i mean it doesn't really mean much until you've been patient and you've been consistent which is a bit of a joke but that's how it is so i would say take that advice and as anastasia put it just just try it as you gain experience all those things will click into place um, it, it's, it's not a very useful piece of advice because the whole point is that advice actually teaches you nothing until you just naturally do it. But that is what I've found. Yeah, but that's really the thing, right? It's like you know it in theory, right? Oh, you have to go out and get your customers, right? And then you spend your time building an app or a feature and it completely fails and you're like, I should have actually done that thing. And now you do it all the time, right? And, and you learn those methods. So I'd be curious to hear if there's any startup book you like, though. Uh, yeah, there, there's, there's a, like, honestly, all of them. I like all of them. When you read them, there's always a nugget in there. Uh, like, all the generic ones, Hard Thing About Hard Things is one of the more recent ones. That one's quite good. Um, he's trying very hard to be cool, but he is cool, and it's, it, it's a good book. Uh, my favorite? Uh, uh, let me think for a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so I guess my advice is uh, if you have an idea and you like uh, if you have an idea and you want to do it and uh, you got to believe yourself and uh, uh, try to uh, try to find the opportunity to realize it and uh, stick with the idea because for me uh, I, I sometimes kind of like sometimes I, I, I kind of ha usually have some ideas and I, I start and then I at some point I start thinking it's probably not not a good idea and and then going back in the forest, uh, probably uh, two, two or three years later, I realized, hey, that's that idea actually works, and and uh, I, sh I, sh I should I should do it earlier. So so I so I think my my advice would be, believe yourself. I think the one I would tell myself is passion with purpose. Uh, I actually think passion is an amazing but also very dangerous thing, where at least in my. Um, you know, path. I was also very pulled into different areas of technology, uh, different types of projects, uh, which I found interesting. Uh, when I was working on particular companies and organizations, like for example the Hyperloop, uh, this was something where uh, you know, oh, this would be great if we had this. We need to make it more efficient. Let me just go out and build that. Let me work with the teams to do this. And sometimes getting pulled in those directions was um, was a negative, right? Because it's like, how do we actually do it with purpose to really prioritize the most important things? to focus on that will move the needle the most. Um, I think it's something CDLs really taught me. It's a program about prioritizing objectives uh, and where the mentors try to push founders to, to kind of do this. Um, and finding out how to focus to build up that tree trunk and then branch out and use those skills for other things I think is a really, really important uh, aspect of mastery. Um, and that's something I, I really try to strive for. Yeah, I, I was trying to think of, I don't have a, a book to recommend. I think they're all pretty good, to be honest. You should just read, I mean, they're, they're easy to read, you know, it's not. Dostoevsky, it's pretty, they're efficient books, so just go read them. 
I, for me personally, I would say the most important thing is agency, the feeling of, of self-agency. Um, not really the desire to do everything yourself, but the knowledge that you're doing something that matters to you because it's the choice that you've chosen to make. Uh, and then I, I think most inspiration for me comes definitely from certain physicists, but mostly from artists, mostly from musicians. I think, for example, Miles Davis is, Miles Davis is probably my biggest inspiration, even though I'm, I'm not doing, I like music, but I'm not doing anything musical because Miles Davis, you know, as a, just a whim of his own agency, created, recreated music probably six times. I mean, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say. You know, it took bebop, made it incredible, eventually did funk, just kept going, cool jazz. I mean, for me, the, the ideal way to live, the ideal mental state with which to live is like this, this, this freedom of mind, this agency with which you could wake up tomorrow, have some incredibly productive musical track like bebop and say, okay, well, I'm going to do cool jazz now because I feel like it. And then everybody's like, wow, man, that's so good. How'd you do that? And then you just do it again. Then you just do it again. You know, I, I think the, the only way you achieve anything like that is by a lot of self-belief and not caring. You know, it's, it's, you can't, you can't have a super strong objective function. It needs to be the enjoyment of your own agency. And if I, if I may, you know, I think, I think also there's this dynamic today in the world, and it, it, it may or may not come to pass, but we're building these very intelligent systems that can code and increasingly can abstract reason. And the work of, of generating knowledge will eventually be less of a, a human cause. Uh, and I think while it still is, while you can be on the edge of your field, while you can feel this full force of agency, you should do it. You should, you should try and feel what, it, what it's like to try and be the best within your vein, because I do think at some point, plausibly soon, you won't get that feeling anymore. Good way to end that. So now we'll open the floor for questions. First, a uh, round of applause for our panel before our questions. OK, so a hand up here. OK, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Um, so I really like the al analogy that uh, the quantum field is really early. It's just like you know, pre the Intel chip era. Um, since this, ta this talk is uh, about career, I want to tie my question back to the career. Um, what uh, do you guys uh, envision would be like in the quantum field in the next five to ten years? Um, could you guys uh, share some of your perspectives? Yeah, I, I can share from a five-year perspective. I, I think the big question for everybody is what application will yield any benefit and what, what will it look like? I think the approach that will be most fruitful is a, is a bottom-up approach. So understanding, OK, uh, this hardware, for some given reason, does this sort of process especially well. Let's say it's a training process. Let's just say it's a training process, OK? And I was, I'm going to reference what I said before. So maybe we want some hardware with a higher sampling rate. So it's going to do these problems especially well. I think applications that work are going to be discovered via this bottom-up approach of taking the hardware and then the subroutines that work especially well, and then building an application on top of these subroutines. I, I would not take the other approach, which is just sort of broadly scouring and then trying to build down uh, some chain of subroutines that happens to work. Uh, what those are, yeah, I'm, honestly, I'm not sure what they will be. I, I, I do expect, like, within five years, some chemistry, I think computational fluid dynamics actually looks quite promising uh, from a variational perspective, like 40, 50 qubit scale. Uh, there, there's, there, I, I would say there's some encouraging signs, uh, but, but honestly, it's an open question. I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think from my end, I'm saying three years for a real application that actually has value. That's not a toy problem. Um, I'm really impressed in the last few months of where the hardware has gone. So people ask about quantum winter and how that's felt are we you know is it coming i think we've passed it a little bit and i think the nice thing about that is ai kind of distracted everyone for a little bit and we actually sat down and got to work and then we actually released some good papers over the last you know few few months and new hardware improvements so i think that's going to happen what i think the next challenge then is going to be the scaling aspect right so if you're looking at any of the systems they all have an issue with scaling that people need to figure out right so for superconducting you're just getting to the point that you, there's companies trying to build you know thousand qubit fridges 
okay, 1,000 qubits would be great, I'd be happy with that, but what comes after that, right? And even then, the 1,000 is, is tough. Um, trapped ions, neutral atoms have their own scaling challenges, right? Like you mentioned, gate times, there's, there's different aspects of scaling there. There's a lot of interesting things going on, and I think what I've also been seeing in the last few months is like photonics is starting to come into play. So something we had been kind of looking at is could we use photonics chips to control RF signals instead? That's interesting. There's been a lot of acquisitions in the photon space, literally over the last like four weeks from companies. So that's an interesting signal to maybe start looking at the photonic space. Uh, I, th I think uh, like I would imagine like uh, so. First of all, I think uh, NISC is is dead, and uh, uh, the pre full tolerant era is coming, and the application is, uh, application algorithm and how we're going to shift in towards that. Uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell like what exactly the application is, but uh, I, th I think uh, in general, simulating a uh, physical system that with quantum effects is promising. Uh, but I can't really tell uh, if there's really a, a such a, a real system that can show practical quantum advantage. Uh, but but I, uh, but but I think the the next uh, the the. the Near, uh, the new emerging however is, uh, is bringing us to a, to a new era of uh, algorithm, re uh, algorithm research uh, and software development. Uh, just briefly, so in the five year span, I think we will still see a lot of uh, you know, similar roles on the more specific subsystems that we're starting to see develop for, for quantum computers and quantum technologies. Uh, as well as more of an, you know, demand for maybe these systems level abstract type of roles like product roles where we're, we're starting to now see, okay, well, we have tools for these subsystems. We kind of have ways to optimize these, these control mechanisms, these error correction things. Like, how do we plug this in into a very scalable uh, way? So a lot of, like, engineering going into those uh, things. And I think this may be the larger adoption where we may pull a lot of the maybe ML engineers or uh, cloud native engineers from a lot of the existing field into quantum because they'll have more of an abstract view of how they interact with quantum systems, but won't necessarily need to be absolute experts of how a, a qubit actually moves information. Um, and I think that's actually going to be really good for the industry because we're going to have this huge flood of talent uh, where they're looking for that next new technology to go. There's going to be you know capital flowing in, and, and they're going to want to uh, be contributors to that field. Um, so I, I do think there's a there's an opportunity there. Thank you. Okay, you got our last question. And then we're gonna go with uh, the people in the stream. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with difficulties like working with physicists and software developers? I remember seeing a YouTube video of you, Anastasia, talking about like having a hard time trying to get physicists to work on GitHub, I think. Oh, so, that, that was such a story. Oh, yeah, so what's I'll the story tell of that. that. Okay, well, I'll tell the story really quickly. Okay, so just ref flat out refused to use GitHub, and I'm like, this is your job. You have to use GitHub, right? But at some point, I was like, I'm just gonna let this like play out, right? So what he was doing, he was like, it's fine. I'm backing it up every night on Google Drive automatically. And I'm like, okay, but like you don't have like a version history. So I went in there and I changed the code and broke it overnight. And then the next morning all his code was broken and he's like, I don't know what happened, like, and I can't change it and I don't know what part of it was changed. And I was like, if you use GitHub, that would have been fixed. And then he started using GitHub. So that was my story. Good move, good move. It's, a, it's the chaos monkey. What was it? The Netflix has like a c code that just deletes random systems and sees how resilient it is. That's me, I'm chaos monkey. Honestly, we, we don't have such a big problem with this, and it's probably just a function of scale. I think we're 18 people right now, so as that scales, inevitably, there will be increasing tension among the different types. But we also tend to hire physicists with some numerical expertise for the reasons I mentioned earlier, and, and that, that tends to make things work. I, I just convinced uh, the boss to force that, and everyone has to use it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we're definitely going in that direction. Uh, I, I've worked with a number of different technical experts and, and, and physicists that are absolute uh, geniuses in their own right. And for, for me, my philosophy of technical management, uh, when you're working with teams like that, if there is a really high potential individual that maybe doesn't have that um, muscle worked yet uh, of, of working on GitHub and, and doing continuous de uh, deployment and things like this. So I, I do think 
you, you have to be careful because sometimes they have so many other skills that maybe other people on the team don't have. And uh, I really try to find the ways, like how do we still engage them and maximize their potential so they feel like they can make that transition. So uh, I do think it's important to have a, a roadmap with them and work with them and say, here's the opportunity for it. Here's what, what can work if you start developing this skill. Um, but really, maybe we can work together or you can work with the team to kind of translate this whiteboard stuff to just base code first and, and getting more used to that piece basically taking steps to their transition to, to integrate more of the team, uh, but such, such a way that they can still maximize their potential, that they, they really have a way to contribute that maybe other people on the team don't have, and that's why they're there, right? So. Yeah, I think that's really the thing. Like, usually it isn't as big of a problem because you kind of want to hire for these sort of characteristics, right, up front. Like I mentioned with the interviews, looking for folks that are kind of coachable. Um, but th I think that's the thing, is stepping back and being like, you know, these other people have these skill sets, and this is how you can help. And I always approach any conversation, whether it's a sales conversation, technical, how can I provide the other person value, right? And then so if you're looking at them, like, why are they not collaborating together? What's going on? It's like, here's the value this person can provide to you that you're just completely missing by behaving this way, right? And so that's one for like the interpersonal. And for the other aspect, I think it's like finding the la correct language, right? Physicists have a very different language than software engineers do. And coming together of like, this is what the words actually mean that they're saying. You, you might be just talking past each other, right? Because that's how you're taught. Like I mentioned, my experience was like, I was writing code in a way. And by putting that language of like physicists code procedurally, I was able to actually look it up. Like, this is actually an industry term. And I was able to look it up and be like, oh, OK, now I can have a model of how I can fix this. And this is why I'm talking past the folks that are PhDs in computer science. So taking that time and intention to be like, why are we not communicating you know, properly? And also showing that value, right? I think for physicists a lot, you know, when, when I also interviewed folks, it was like, hey, we're not a research lab. Like, there's a lot of cool stuff going on here, but I'm going to set the expectations like we have to get stuff like out to product, right? What does that product mean? That means it's usable in these ways. And these are characteristics that are just as important as the fundamental research behind it. So when you put it in that way, it becomes a lot more clear like, OK, we have to collaborate. Actually, I, 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 I do think it's important for there to be a, an outlet for abstract creativity within a job. You might be doing something very pragmatic a lot of the time, but if you come from a you know, four or five year PhD, you generally like the abstract in a lot of cases. And if you never get the ability to exercise that, you get frustrated. Uh, in what we've started doing, and we've only done one so far, is, is run internal hackathons sort of at the end um, of every two months. And that's you know, two to four days on whatever. And oftentimes, it does yield some beneficial techniques or ideas or directions. But a lot of the time, it's just a creative outlet for people to talk about different things and work on different things. Cool, right. check. Oh, okay, here, yeah, I got a question from the chat here and then that, that'll be it for today. So um, we have a question from uh, Tutu Nenius on Twitch. <laughs> the difference in being a practical application and being a product was not clear to me in the points you were making. Uh, what would be that difference? So the difference between a practical application <laughs> I think we got your question. Uh, question about the difference between a practical application and a product. Um, maybe I can start here. It, it, it is a very fundamental difference, and I think it really comes down to when you say a practical application, this can really come uh, at the cusp of the end of the research phase when you're researching whether this is uh, a useful way. Is the benchmark of that you know, large enough to, to make a difference? A product on that, on, on, a, on a fundamental level, really is getting closer to uh, a business, right? Getting closer to the customer, uh, the understanding what would the cost of this be? What's the cost of them adopting this new technology to replace something that they may already be doing to solve a similar problem? Um, and, and understanding more from even a human behavior perspective, is this useful enough for them to, to convince others within their organization to champion it, uh, to actually be first adopters? Um, so I, I do think it's a bit more um, in the direction of abstraction of uh, actually bringing it to a business. And I really think that understanding what those features are that are most important for that user is going to be very fundamentally different than maybe if this is a practical application of it. So um, I just think it's later on in the stage and in a, in a certain direction of, of how you might want to bring that technology to someone's hands. Right. Like we have products right now out in the quantum market that are not 
practical applications of the systems. There are platforms, there are simulators. Those are all products. And I echo that. A product to me is something that is delivered to the end user in a usable way. So usability is a huge portion of that. You know, a lot of other factors. You can write me a lot of code if it solves, if it cracks, you know, encryption, practical application. But if nobody else can run it, it's not really useful for anything else. And that's where the product line is for me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, a product is something you sell. It contains some useful application, but it also contains a lot of experience and usability that makes it appealing and, and does other things, you know, psychological things, like makes it appealing, for example, for the manager who's responsible of the team to buy it for their team. The way you steer the usability affects who you sell it to. And this might be, for example, the distinction between how Microsoft sells software to the, the managers of the team versus others who focus on the individual members of that team. So all these things are psychologically tailored to who's buying it. And, and that you don't, that's just not within the domain of a practical application. Yeah, I think, I think for practical application, uh, it's more like a, uh, you can need to show like you can actually do some, solve a real world problem that is uh, uh, valuable to other people. But for product, it's um, uh, even if you have a practical application, uh, you have to deliver it to your customer, and and you have to deal with uh, even a small problem like uh, your customer doesn't like this button, and you need to make it uh, larger, or something like that. So so there's a like a dis dis distinction in that sense. All right, good question. Um, I think that'll do it for today, everybody. So thanks so much for, for joining us today. Um, I'm sure uh, the panelists will be mingling around for the rest of the day. So if you do want to have a quick chat with them, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to do that. Thanks, everybody, online for watching.